Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar. Today's topic is coronavirus, labor and employment updates. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to go over a few housekeeping items. My name is Joanna and I am the webinar organizer for today. We want to make sure today's presentation is extremely valuable for you. So we ask that you submit all questions by clicking on the question button in the control panel and typing your questions there. Now, please join me in welcoming the webinar moderator, Betsy Keck, president of Edge Communications, a local marketing and communications firm. Betsy. Thank you so much, Joanna. I appreciate that. Um, and welcome everyone who is joining us today. Um, sometimes it's hard to believe that this pandemic is really happening to us. It, it just seems like it's something out of a movie um, and therefore unreal. But uh, here we are. And luckily, we've um, got great leadership in the state of Ohio guiding us through this. Um, and I think the silver lining to all of this for us uh, as employers and employees is that this experience is making us stronger wiser and more resilient and hopefully today we can further add to that wiser part with our webinar um, our speakers today are all partners with fisher phillips it's a na national labor and employment law firm with 36 offices in the united states including one here in downtown cleveland uh, to start uh speak our our first speaker is jasmine stover and she is going to talk about ohio's stay in place order jasmine Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as everyone knows, and is probably either working out of the comforts of their own home now, or doing so complying with social distancing requirements of the order in their offices, Ohio issued the stay-at-home order that on March 22nd, um, that was from the Ohio Department of Health. That order was initially to remain in effect through April 6th. However, on April 2nd, it was extended through May 1st. Um, what that order does is it requires every business to determine whether or not they meet the definition of an essential business or essential business operations here within the state of Ohio. And if they do meet that definition, then they were required to take a look at their workforce and determine what employees can work from home if possible. And if so, to, to allow those employees to work from home and then to implement certain social distancing protocols within the workplace. Um, for those employers or businesses that were not did not meet the definition of essential, they were able to stay open to maintain their minimum essential operations, but otherwise their employees would not be working directly within the business itself. So when the order was extended on April 2nd, it did do several things um, or amended several things. It included the order to include um, public and private pools, as well as campground, recreational sports tournaments, and day clamps. Those are also now ordered closed and as not essential businesses. Um, it also included additional travel restrictions for individuals entering the state of Ohio. If they were not entering, um, if, they're, if they were coming in, in and out of the state, but it wasn't for a primary business purpose, then they are required to quarantine for 14 days. Additionally, those individuals that had been um, experiencing symptoms or diagnosed with COVID-19 were required to quarantine for uh, 14 days as well, or uh, and only able to enter the state if they were considered a permanent resident. Otherwise, if they were diagnosed or exhibiting symptoms and were not a permanent resident, they should not be permitted to enter, enter the state. Um, there was another update for those businesses that have a single, that consists of a single person, and those businesses are allowed to stay open as long as all workplace safety standards are being met. Um, additional, they're asking um, stores and where uh, individuals are entering the business there, you should now see this when you go into any store, that they're posting the maximum number of individuals that are permitted within the, within the um, workplace. And then within that business, whether there are lines inside or outside, all individuals must maintain a six foot distance. So there is no uh, set number of people within the order, but every business had to determine that on their own and what the maximum number of individuals allowed within their business are. So those are the primary amendments to Ohio stay at home order um, and any updates or changes to that order effective as of April 2nd. 
All right, wonderful. Thank you, Jasmine. Sarah Moore now will cover sick leave and FMLA. Sarah? Thanks, Betsy. I want to thank Betsy for uh, facilitating this opportunity for us to join you all today. It's very cool seeing that there's 85 of you and you have not uh, hit the wall of uh, meeting fatigue by uh, by teleconference, um, which uh, a lot of people are are running into. So we're going to talk about the Families First Coronavirus, Coronavirus Response Act for a few minutes. And as many of you likely know, uh, that act has two primary components to it, the uh, employee paid sick leave component and then the extended family medical leave act component. So this act is in effect from April 1st of this year until December 31st. It does not apply retroactively, which is important to keep in mind if there are questions from employees regarding how to handle days prior to April 1st, uh, the act simply does not apply to those days. So are you a covered employer? Uh, the question is a snap snapshot question, which means that we look at it at the point in time that the employee asks for the leave and we determine does the employer have less than 500 employees so 1 to 499 are the magic numbers and in looking at that we're going to count how many employees do we have currently active full-time part-time or temporary if you've got uh, temporary workers or you're a joint employer you need to count those folks you need to count the people who are on leave as part of that complement so assuming you hit that number let's focus in on the paid leave component. So with that piece, with our employees who are asking for that leave, they don't need to be with us for that long a period of time. In fact, they could step into the workplace on day one and uh, they would be eligible for the paid sick leave component of this act. There are different grounds for uh, qualifying for the act and uh, for the, this portion of uh, the leave and the basis for the qualification ends up dictating how much pay the individual is entitled to. So the first three areas are you are subject to a stay at home order or a quarantine type order from a, a government agency. So in Ohio, we're under the orders that Jasmine just spoke of and uh, technically everyone falls underneath the act on that basis. Uh, the second is that you are experiencing symptoms of COVID uh, and you are seeking a diagnosis, so you've not yet been diagnosed. Uh, and then the last one is a healthcare provider has had you go into self-quarantine uh, because likely you have COVID and uh, or are assumed to potentially have COVID or have been exposed and have been directed to be in self-quarantine. So if you qualify on these bases, you are entitled to your regular rate of pay. Uh, and you are capped at $511 a day, up to a total of $5,110 in the aggregate. The last three bases for qualifying under this portion of the act are caring for a son or daughter who uh, school is closed or our child care provider is unavailable um, in Ohio, all, all of um, because of the order uh, schools are closed and daycare centers are closed and so there are a lot of people who will qualify on that basis. To care for um, an individual who is subject to self-quarantine or if you are experiencing other substantially similar type conditions as defined by the Department of Health and, Ham uh, Health and Human Services. So if you qualify on one of these bases you are entitled to two-thirds your rate of pay up to a $200 maximum per day or $2,000 in the total. Uh, employers are required to have a notice up under this act and there's a model notice that the Department of Labor has issued that a lot of employers are simply placing on their websites given that a lot of uh, places are, are remote or uh, in a position that they have minimized staff. In terms of other paid leave, there are questions as to if I've got uh, PTO, can I force my employees to use the PTO before they would go on the paid sick leave? And the answer is no, 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 do not do that. Uh, this is a brand new type of leave and you qualify for it and an employer cannot force the employee to do that. Keep in mind that if you qualify for the paid sick leave on the two thirds rate, an employee does have an opportunity 
to ask the employer to supplement their pay up to their full rate using PTO time. So in that case, uh, an employee would ask to supplement uh, that gap and the employer would be in a position of either agreeing to that or not agreeing to that. There needs to be a mutual agreement for that to occur. Uh, also keep in mind that an employee is not required to find their replacements. So if they are coming to you for this type of leave, you can't have them do that. The next portion of uh, FFCRA is the Extended Family Medical Leave Act. You're gonna use the same employer uh, snapshot approach and looking at are you under 499 employees. In terms of the employee, the employee who's asking for the leave must have been on your payroll uh, 30 days prior to asking for the leave, 30 calendar days prior. In terms of taking this leave, you have to take it for one narrow basis and that is to care for a child who is under the age of 18, a son or daughter, uh, if their school is closed or childcare is closed due to a public health emergency. So we certainly have that in the state of Ohio right now. The first 10 days of this extended family medical leave is unpaid, but the if the individual is eligible for the paid sick leave that I just spoke of, then you can use that for the first 10 days so that they get paid during that first initial 10 days that would otherwise be unpaid. At that point, they go into uh, a regular kind of FMLA mode um, where the employer or the employee can substitute paid time off um, on the same basis that an individual would qualify regularly under the policy. And uh, if that substitution is not elected or if um, it has been exhausted, then you will move into a two thirds regular rate of pay for the employees capped at $200 a day and $10,000 in the aggregate. So in that sense, it is different from FMLA in that there is a monetary component. In terms of reinstatement after utilizing this extended FMLA, if you have more than 25 employees, the regular reinstatement rights under FMLA will apply to individuals taking this leave. If you have under 25 employees, then there may be a basis for the reinstatement provisions to not apply. In terms of uh, maintaining health care during the time that folks are on the extended FMLA, you have the same uh, obligations in terms of continuing health care on the same basis that it would have been offered if they had been working. And then in terms of um, closure or layoffs that occur, if a layoff or closure has occurred from that day forward, an individual would not be entitled to uh, leave under the FFCRA. And instead, the individual would need to apply for unemployment and would receive benefits from that source. In terms of documentation, there are a lot of regulations that have come out because if you provide the FFCRA leave as required, then there is an opportunity to apply for tax credits at a later time. To do so, employers need to maintain documentation. And uh, the basic documentation is to have a signed statement from the employee, name, dates requested, a statement of the reason that they qualify for the leave that is being taken, and a statement that they are unable to work or telework. And uh, if it is due to a government closure, then you should reference or attach the order of closure. If it is due to self-quarantine, uh, then you need the name of the healthcare provider, not documentation, just the name. And if it's to care for another person, you need the name and relationship and then the name of the health provider. And then if it is due to a school uh, situation, closure, you need the name and age of the child. If the child is over the age of 14, the employee should give a, um, a written statement of a special circumstance that requires them to be supervising uh, their child during the time that they would otherwise be working. And then last but not least, in terms of can you take uh, this leave on an intermittent basis? And the answer is it depends. So if you're teleworking, the employee is teleworking, they can take either the paid sick leave or the extended EFMLA 
uh, on an intermittent basis. If, however, they are working at a regular work site, they can only do the extended FMLA on an intermittent basis. Otherwise, they need to take full days. And any inter intermittent leave has to be agreed upon with the employer. So as the employer, if intermittent leave just does not work for you, you have an opportunity to uh, decline on that basis. And with that, I will turn it back to Ms. Keck. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah. I appreciate it. Um, my apologies, everyone. I did not uh, show the slide with uh, that shows uh, Jasmine when she was speaking. So I just wanted to show this uh, slide. Uh, you know, as as one of the panelists or one of the organizers, my screen has a lot of different boxes showing up. So uh, my apologies for not showing this screen while she was talking. But here she is. Here is her screen and her contact information. And then we'll go back to Sarah. And then we will now go on to our next speaker. Uh, Jeff Smith will be speaking on everyone's favorite topic, benefits. Jeff. Hey. Thanks, Betsy. I was muted there for a second. Um, so the employee benefits uh, ramifications of the COVID crisis are quite many. And uh, as you may know from dealing with uh, your company's benefits plans, those topics tend to change uh, and uh, over time. So what, what I'm talking about now may be different than what I might tell you in, in a month or what I told you a month ago. So the first point is uh, due to the, uh, the COVID crisis um, through the uh, FFCRA law that uh, Sarah mentioned and through the, um, the CARES Act, there have been a variety of changes to benefit plan rules that are for the benefit of the employees. Uh, for example, uh, COVID-19 testing is now something that is to be required free of charge with no copay or um, coinsurance or going towards the deductible. And most carriers should have uh, communicated with you already about that. Uh, in addition, uh, treating that uh, uh, COVID-19 testing uh, or uh, related uh, preventative services uh, should not impact the eligibility to participate in a high deductible group health plan or contribute to uh, health savings accounts. Um, as you may know, typically a health savings account uh, requires that you have a, a deductible of, uh, a, of more than $1,000. It's, it's actually a bit higher at this point, uh, but, but the requirement is that there's no uh, cost sharing before the deductible is met, but this is a special circumstance and the Congress has uh, allowed those uh, testing to be paid for uh, without impacting eligibility there. The, the next feature would be uh, related to 401k plans. We've got some uh, existing issues and that would uh, relate to uh, contributions that employers may make uh, to those plans, whether that's a match or a profit sharing contribution. Uh, if you have a matching contribution, sometimes uh, that is a safe harbor type contribution. And if you are looking to change your safe harbor contribution in the middle of a plan year to, to save, uh, to, to conserve cash, you do have to understand that there's a notice requirement to do that. And that will take you out of the safe harbor option for the balance of the year. As you know, the safe harbor option allows an employer to avoid plan testing. And if you opt out of that, you will be required to test plans for purposes of the ADP and ACP test. And uh, th those are the tests that potentially uh, re require that highly compensated employees receive some of their contributions back. So make sure that you are understanding the, the full impact of that. Uh, in terms of profit sharing, some employers have fixed profit sharing amounts that are uh, stated in the plan document, although I think many employers nowadays uh, will have a discretionary amount. If you're making those contributions on a basis that is throughout the year, uh, make sure that you provide uh, notice to your employees that those are changed. If your plan has a fixed amount, make sure you update the plan document to permit that change. And if you have any union uh, employees, make sure that you obtain 
uh, an agreement with the union before you make any of those changes. And, th and that would really go to uh, any of these uh, economic type uh, issues that we're talking about. Finally, the, the CARES Act has provided some specific relief for individuals with regard to uh, distributions from plans. The CARES Act waives the 10% early uh, distribution penalty that is levied against distributions that are taken out of uh, 401k plans. And that allows a distribution of up to $100,000 for an individual that is affected by the, uh, the COVID-19 crisis. It appears that that standard is uh, pretty low. You just have to say you're affected and you don't have to have any specific proof. Although I would recommend that individuals that take that have at least a colorable claim that they are uh, impacted by the, the COVID crisis. Uh, in addition, there have been changes to the loan provisions uh, under the Internal Revenue Code, and that allows loans to go from a maximum of $50,000 to a maximum of $100,000. And finally, there are, there's the ability for employees to defer loan payments back to their 401k plan for uh, up to a year. So anyone who has an existing 401k loan should be permitted to uh, defer those payments and uh, they can also receive a, uh, an increase in their maximum repayment period. So the, the only, uh, cost of doing that is the interest that will be uh, due on those payments while you're, you're not making them. We expect more guidance from the IRS on all of these issues. Uh, as you may know, the IRS is typically a very uh, behind in providing advice on uh, retirement plan issues, so uh, stay tuned. Uh, thank you. All right, thank you, Jeff. I appreciate your, your presenting and um, it, looks like we're having some technical difficulties with regards to Scott joining the call. Um, Scott is our last speaker. Scott Gideon is going to speak about workers' compensation and its impact. So I think in the meantime, while we're waiting for him to uh, resolve those issues, uh, we can check and see if there's any questions that anyone has. Um, it looks like there are some. Uh, Joanna or Allison, could you perhaps help me? I'm having a hard time seeing the questions. They're like, collapsed. Um, okay, here it looks like, okay, does the, uh, sorry. Hi, this is Joanna. Uh, there is a question, um, and I can just go back to Jeff. Uh, the question came in, uh, does that apply to 4013B plans too? Um, so I th the question was whether that applies to a 403B plan. Um, I believe that all of the CARES Act changes apply equally to the different types of defined contribution plans, whether it's a 401k, 403b. So, yes. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, does the waiving of 10% for early withdrawal apply to any retirement plan? Uh, that's uh, 401k balances moved to IRAs. Um, so that's an interesting question. The answer is yes, the 401k balance can be uh, taken out up to $100,000 and um, you can actually deposit those uh, that sum right into an IRA and it would be like it's a rollover contribution. And uh, if you take it out of the 401k and put it into an IRA, you can avoid uh, the 10% penalty as well as the income tax. Uh, that, that's actually kind of a, if, if you're able to take it out of the plan and put it into an IRA, the question is whether you, you really have a financial need, but uh, the IRS seems to contemplate that uh, as an option, so you, you can do that. Thank you. Um, here's another question. Uh, what are the rights an employee has when they decide simply not to show up to work without notice? and has not seek medical evaluation and doesn't want to be exposed to people. Our company is under 25 employees. It's a great question. So um, part of this is that the regulations that the Department of Labor is issuing are coming out um, every few days. And so 
the answer to this could very well change as uh, those regulations keep coming out. But for right now, we're in a position where if whether you're under 25 employees or over 25 employees, the answer is going to be essentially the same. And that is that if you have work and an individual is able to come to work and does not qualify um, or is eligible for the FFCRA leave, either, either components, then technically they should be coming to work. And if they refuse to come to work, um, they can be considered to have abandoned their job and or um, you know, insubordination could apply. The difficulty is that a lot of companies are faced with a challenge in making a decision in that circumstance uh, because we don't know how long this is gonna go on. And um, for some of the workers who are taking these stances, they're skilled workers. And so uh, it's not as easy as um, I can get rid of this person and replace them with another. So a lot of companies are challenged by trying to figure out how to balance the concerns of that particular individual against how to move through the needs of the business. Um, if you are under 25 employees, you are in a better position to make the arguments that uh, the individual uh, has effectively chosen to be unemployed. In terms of the unemployment implications, um, not, not so clear. So um, the relaxed nature of the unemployment law right now is such that if the individual simply utilizes uh, the mass layoff form and applies for the unemployment, there's no double checking back with the employers at this point to see what the basis is from the employer's perspective. So a lot of these claims are just going through and effectively the person can get the unemployment benefits unchallenged and then, you know, whether there'll be an opportunity at, at a later point to um, address that is a completely different kind of issue, concern. We don't know how that'll play out. So hopefully that's answered your question. Um, and if you have a follow-up on that, please, uh, please do so. Thank you. Um, just another question is, what has uh, Jasmine heard regarding, let's see, uh, what has Jasmine heard regarding enforcement actions for businesses slash individuals violating the order? So I think they're, those are kind of similar questions, but wanted Jasmine's perspective. Jasmine, I think you're on mute. <laughs> All right, can you, you hear go. me now? All right, yes. sorry about that. Um, so one thing that I should have mentioned is that the um, amended order also adds an enforcement and penalty provision that's codified on, at the Ohio Revised Code 3701.252. So um, what it provides for is a fine of $750 or up to not more than 90 days in jail um, in the event that the Department of Health determines that someone isn't violating the order or that a business is staying open by violating the order. Interestingly, what the amended order does is that it provides a dispute resolution process where the Ohio um, Director of Health can um, institute a commission or appoint a commission to go to review whether or not the business should be deemed an essential business. Um, I will note that last week, I want to Thursday or Friday, I saw that the Cuyahoga County Prosecutor's Office did file a nuisance action against a business that was staying open um, and considering itself to be an essential business. And um, clearly the Ohio Department of Health is challenging that. While they can, while they have the penalty provisions under under 3701.25, I think it's interesting that they filed a nuisance action because Ohio's nuisance law allows the county to board up or close a business for of a, of a period up to a year. So we'll have to see how that um, how that shakes out. Um, what I've also heard from my colleagues in other offices is that where a business has been challenged, let's say someone's made a report stating that my employer is staying open, we do not believe we're essential. They've con um, the Department of Health has contacted those um, businesses or the county director of health con contacted those businesses directly to discuss whether or not they are essential. Thank you. 
Uh, Jeff, here's a question for you. Is there any relief for employers to defer match in Safe Harbor 401k until later date? Um, I think that would depend upon the, the, the type of, of matching contribution. If your match is made on a, um, an annual basis, you don't have to make that match at, uh, at this point. You just need to make it by uh, basically by the time you file the, uh, the, the companies or the organization's return uh, next year. Uh, if it's on a per pay period basis, uh, I, I think at this point you'd have to follow the plan. Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of anything uh, allowing a change there. Okay, um, let's see, I have, if an EE, -E, I'm not sure what that means, if an EE -E withdraws from an IRA, is there a 10% waiver in this case? So, so the question is whether an employee takes uh, funds out of an IRA, um, whether the 10% the waiver applies. Uh, and if that is due to a, um, a COVID-19 uh, certification, uh, yes, that, that, that would apply at this point. But the income tax is still apply to those amounts that are with the bond. There's a question here. Um, if an employee has been advised to stay home because a resident in their home has cancer and there is a concern about him bringing something home, is this payable under FFCRA? Um, well, <laughs> it depends how they fill out the form. Um, so if uh, the employee in filling out the form simply marks the box that they're caring for an individual um, who is under uh, self-quarantine uh, or with symptoms, there's a potential that that would be um, recognized just simply on the basis of, this, of the certifying form that the employee submits, uh, that that would be eligible under the paid leave component it would not be eligible under the extended FMLA component. Now the question becomes, well, what if I know that it's um, not COVID related, that it's, it's just cancer? Um, so that's, that's a difficult one in terms of uh, how you handle that as an employer. Technically, it's not gonna qualify under the um, paid sick leave provisions. And if you pay for it, uh, you likely would not be entitled to the tax credit or that could be challenged at a later time. Um, whether you decide to go ahead and, and provide that pay, you're allowed to go above and beyond the FFCRA in terms of what you provide to your employees. The FFCRA just provides the minimum uh, that must be, must be provided. Okay. And then another question is uh, regarding, um, in that same vein, I guess, is what is the exact definition of care for a child? Is it to help them with homework or talk with teachers um, and what age? Uh, great question. So we continue to get uh, regulations on this piece as well. And essentially, a lot of schools are providing uh, distance learning online. And so initially the question was, well, if there's distance learning online, then my kid's in front of a computer or the employee's kid's in front of a computer with a teacher, so they're being supervised, so the employee should be able to come to work. It's not that simple. Um, it's been recognized uh, through the regulations that just because distance learning is being provided um, does not alter the status of the schools being closed. So the schools are still considered to be closed for purposes of the FFCRA and the employer's obligations. If the child is under the age of 14, there is a presumption that there needs to be supervision. If the child is over the age of 14, then um, the IRS regulation guidance that has come out has said that the employee needs to cert certify to the employer through written statement that there's a special circumstance that requires the employee to be present. Um, helping with homework, you know, does that qualify? The difficulty is the IRS guidance doesn't 
go into a deep dive in, in terms of what qualifies for special circumstance. And that kind of makes sense because the IRS guidance is coming from a perspective of um, analyzing whether the employer qualifies for the tax credit. And so the documentation the employer needs is just that written statement that uh, the kid has a, a special circumstance that requires the adult to be present. That guidance is not intended to water down the provisions of the FFCRA relative to um, uh, being entitled to those by virtue of the school being closed of the child. So all that being said, the paid sick leave provision and the EFMLA specifically recognize that if a son or daughter is under the age of 18, you qualify for it. And um, so on that basis, the employer should be recognizing that they qualify. If the kid's over the age of 14, they need to have the special circumstance identified by the employee, but don't go into a deep dive on it. It kind of is what it is. Um, and we'd rather have you err on the side of providing the leave in that circumstance versus um, going down the road of potentially being challenged at a later time. Thank you. Does an employee need to uh, take, does an employee needing to take the paid sick leave need to fill out a form and sign that they are needing the leave? Same for the FMLA leave, is that? Yeah, another great question. So in order for the employer to get the tax credit, we've got to have documentation. And that documentation takes the form of the employee signing a statement saying that they uh, um, meet the criteria. So what we have are forms that um, are similar to leave forms that you see for other types of leave where the employee needs to fill it out. And in filling it out, they're checking off the appropriate boxes and providing the information that I spoke of. So for example, if they are taking the leave because they have COVID symptoms um, and have been directed to be under self-quarantine, uh, they need to provide the name of their health provider, not medical documentation, just the name of the health provider within that form. And so that form kind of guides you through the basics that need to be checked and the information that needs to be provided in order for the employer to dot the I's, cross the T's and have what they need to apply for the tax credit later. Great. Um, how do we determine if an employee is eligible for one of the first three reasons if they are off on EFMLA and want to get paid for the first 10 days? So um, remember, the first three reasons don't have anything to do with child care. Um, child care is the, so to have the extended FMLA, there's only one circumstance that you qualify on that basis for, and that's where that your son or daughter has a school that's closed or child care provider um, unavailable. In that circumstance, you can qualify for both components of the FFCRA. Um, if it is not a child care related issue or school related issue for a child, um, you're not going to you're not going to be dealing with the extended FMLA requirements at all. Okay. And the follow up question to that was, um, if so, where to get the form? So I, I'm not sure if that's related to the qu question. Hold on one second. You might need to have. That was actually related to the questions for the sick leave and the um, FML leave. Do they? I think you had addressed Sarah where the forms were. Correct? Yeah. So um, I don't. I don't think that there's been a model form on that that's come out of DOL. I know that we've put together a form. So. Um, there's different resources to obtain a form and feel free to contact any one of us if you need help. Okay, great, thank you. Under the FML, or sorry, EFMLA, at what point does this end if the children being watched are only being watched due to school closure? So since the end of the school year is the next is in the next few weeks, five or six weeks, can you end the leave due to the end of the school year? That'd be nice. <laughs> um, it will depend. It will depend on what the um, uh, child care needs were uh, likely to be over the summer. So remember that that the 
the basis is not just school closings, it's um, child care uh, closures or child care being unavailable. Child care being unavailable includes babysitters, grandparents, um, other adults who might be watching the children and supervising them. Uh, so hopefully that answers that question. Okay, great. To that point, I'd add that the amended order also closes day camps. So that's going to pose a lot of issues for parents who normally would send their kid away to a day camp um, when school's out. So keep that in, in mind as well. Great. You know, uh, Sandy Dietrich was asking, uh, we were just told we had to get documentation, a letter from the health care provider for tax credit reimbursement. But I believe Sarah, I believe Sarah, you said that they just needed to have the name of the health care provider. Can you clarify on that? Sure. The regulations right now indicate that you just need the name of the health care provider, uh, nothing more. That could change. In Ohio, keep in mind that with uh, the orders that we're under, we are to minimize uh, the interaction with uh, medical providers. Um, so it in large part involves a coordination between those acts. That said, this is changing very, very frequently and very rapidly. So um, right now we'd advise don't be contacting for documentation but that could change at a later time, which is why it's important to have the name of the healthcare provider. Great, okay, thank you. For Jeff, we have a question um, about uh, applying things to the four, sorry, 403B plans. Did we already answer that question? Yes. Yes. Okay, all um, right, sorry. I can, um, the, the next question, uh, we jump down to, um, can we give points under an attendance policy if people choose not to come to work simply because they are quote unquote afraid? And the answer is um, provided uh, that it is simply because they're they're afraid, you know, to come back, you can certainly go down the road of applying your attendance policies in a fashion that um, designates those days as failure to report. And to the extent you then meet the threshold uh, under your policies for termination on the basis of being AWOL, you can proceed in that fashion. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure, Betsy, if you wanna, I can jump down. Uh, yeah, going back. Down, I'm, I'm, yeah, I think we kind of overlapped. Sorry, I think we overlapped a little bit in the, the answering questions, but yeah, if you wanted to, I'm just making sure we're not missing anything, but. Yeah, so I'm at uh, the time point would be good. I'm at 12.31 p.m. Um, Julie Harrington sent in uh, two questions. One is going back to the scenario where an employee chooses not to work due to fear of the virus. How should we handle collecting the employee's portion of health insurance premiums due when there isn't a paycheck to deduct from? Jeff, do you want to take that? I'm sorry, I thought I was muted. Can you repeat that question? I was um, not following it. Sure. Uh, going back to the scenario where an employee chooses not to work due to fear of the virus, how should we handle collecting the employee's portion of health insurance premiums due when there isn't a paycheck to deduct from? So, so there's a couple of ways that you can do that. Uh, first of all, all the comments that were made about an employee uh, choosing not to work are going to apply, but if you are going to your employees to make that uh, determination not work for uh, and not receive any pay um, you, know, you, you can certainly do that now you can require that an employee pay those contributions um, through a check to the company you can choose to collect those when they return to work uh, you can also delay them under the Ohio order, which allowed a 60-day uh, delay in terms of making uh, contributions uh, to, to the health. So you have some options. If you require that an employee collect, uh, pay those while they are not working, and then they don't do that, 
you could uh, have them, uh, their eligibility for the plan um, terminated. But that does seem to be a free all. So I would recommend that you work with your employees uh, for those uh, issues. Thank you. Uh, Julie has a follow-up question. We have had an employee that has had a fever three times after being sent home for 72 hours each time. He insists he has not had a fever. As the employer, we feel we shouldn't risk exposing other employees to someone with a fever, and we believe our thermometer is working fine. Any thoughts on this? <laughs> Wow. Well, certainly, um, the, you know, the taking the temperatures, um, we have a pass relative to um, the Americans with Disabilities Act, so, so that's good. Um, whether there's exposure under other federal and state laws, you know, the question becomes, are we uniformly applying um, the practice to all of the employees? So assuming that um, the company is doing so, you know, uniformly applying that practice to all employees, um, you know, it's, it's putting itself in a defensible position. Uh, I would definitely check, you know, again, to make sure that that thermometer is, uh, is accurate and is working appropriately. If this is an individual who happens to be in a protected class, um, you may want to go the extra step of um, checking in with the individual to see if there's any information that the individual wants to provide um, beyond uh, you know just the, the temperature having been taken for the employer to consider. Um, you know that might put you in the box of of having um, gone the step of in good faith inquiring, um, but be careful in in asking that question to not probe into medical issues, you know, just a, a very generalized statement. Um, but given that that practice is following CDC guidance and uh, the best known information from the health uh, sector, you know, you're, you're probably on good grounds, but I'd, I'd stay on top of that issue relative to keeping an eye on if there is a potential disparate impact type claim. Um, and trying to head that off as much as possible by demonstrating that you are in good faith, trying to make sure that it's applied uniformly and that you are giving opportunity to consider other information if the employee is willing to share anything. Is there a state uh, leave request template available? There's not a state leave request template. Um, this is a, a federal law, so uh, we'd be looking for a model form from the Department of Labor. I've not seen one yet. Uh, I know that we've put one together and I know other firms are putting uh, forms together, uh, but you could you know, keep a lookout for what, whether DOL releases anything. In the interim, if you're curious in terms of those different things that should be in the written statement from the employee, if you go to the Department of Labor, they have a series of uh, facts uh, questions. I think it's like one through 71. And within there, there are a few questions in regard to what an employer um, should, should gather in terms of information, documentation, and what an employee should be providing and that can guide and has guided a lot of human resource departments to develop forms. Um, but I would check in with uh, your legal counsel. Thank you. Uh, does the 80 hours of paid leave under uh, the FFCRA need to be consecutive or can an employee take days here and there? So great question. Um, if it is for anything um, related to having COVID. Um, so you have symptoms, you're in quarantine, you're caring for someone uh, who has, uh, who's in quarantine. On, on those three bases, uh, you are in a situation where you need to be taking it in full days and you're not gonna be taking it on an intermittent basis. If you happen to have COVID in the symptoms, 
you have to take it in full days consecutively till it's used up or you are cleared to return to work by a medical provider, whichever one comes earlier. Um, if you are teleworking, uh, it's a kind of a different situation. You can take um, the, the leave on an intermittent basis, but if you're at the actual work site, it's got to be in full days. I'm not sure exactly what this is referring to, but it says, can this apply if employee is allowed to work from home? Um, so we can also ask Sean if he would be willing to provide a follow-up to. Yeah, can um, Sean, if you're there, I can, uh, we can unmute you. Let's find Sean. Oops. Sean McPhillips. Alphabetized, but it's not showing his name. Where are you, Sean? Yep, here he is. Okay, Sean, are you there? Sean, hey. I unmuted you. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes. Hello? Oh, um, so if someone's working from home, you can apply for this program. Like, I mean, if they have kids, let's say, you know, they have. Sean, I'm not sure we're able to understand. We couldn't hear you. Um, you're, you're, you were muffled. Um, Can you get maybe closer to the phone? Can you hear me now? Yes, Hello? perfect. Um, so if someone's working from home, but they have a kid, could they say, I want to take care of my kid and not work from home, even though we give them that opportunity. Hmm. Again, these are um, not not simple questions or answers. Um, so there's uh, the spirit of the FFCRA is that employers and employees are working together um, to come to an agreement, uh, particularly when it comes to teleworking and intermittent leave. Um, from the employer's perspective, there's an expectation that with the telework, um, particularly telework that can happen outside of normal business hours, that, um, that the employee will be able to adapt their home circumstance to be able to, um, to work. And so when it comes to the, the child care component, um, we're finding that a lot of employers and employees are able to work out um, the hours that the individual will do the teleworking. Um, we stress with the employers to um, develop a, uh, a communication with the employee that fosters trying to find a resolution where the employee will, um, will either come to work. You know, so for example, if you have hours that an employee normally worked on first shift, and they need to be home for daycare. Some employers are offering um, second shift hours, you know, obviously essential businesses, second shift hours to that worker. And that worker um, comes in for the second shift. Um, so there are different types of ways of approaching this. The, the, the thing to keep in mind is to have a line of communication with your employee where you are focused on trying to um, meet the basics under these laws, but also uh, get them to work as, get them back to work or working as quickly as possible. So I, I don't mean to be cryptic in answering that, but a lot of this depends on the one-on-one -on -one relationship that you develop with your employee in navigating these issues. Thank you. Um, I was gonna say we have two more questions. Betsy, did you wanna? Oh, I just want to make sure, do we answer the question about the waiving of the 10% for early withdrawal? That was an early one, so you might have. Yes, we we, um, we, we answered that one. Okay, so uh, if you want to go ahead and read the last couple, that's great. Sure. The state of Ohio does not have a paid leave law requirement. Does F FSCRA trump this requirement? I'm not, I'm not sure I'm understanding the question. Can you repeat that? Sure. It says the state of Ohio does not have a paid leave law requirement. 
does, does FSCRA trump this requirement? Maybe it's the FF? Yeah, so there is, I agree, there is no state law paid leave requirement relative to, um, to COVID. And um, so in terms of uh, FFCRA, it applies. Um, it's a federal law. It applies to all public and private employers that have less than 500 uh, employees. So that, that range of one to 499 employees. If you are an employer with that number of employees, then you are covered uh, by this federal law and you need to comply with it. Thank you. Uh, the last question that we have right now uh, uh, is by uh, Corey. So uh, don't think this question has been asked, so no, no need to uh, apologize. The statements that are being collected from employees in regards to the e EFMLA, do they need to be in a particular format? Will they be submitted somewhere when filing 941? So they, at this point, they do not need to be in a specific format. They do need to have certain information. That information can be found on the Department of Labor website under the facts um, questions that I had, I had referenced before. And also with respect to the child care component, the IRS guidance relative to kids who are 14 and over needing that statement of special circumstance. So provided that you have that information, you have what you need documentation wise. We don't have any guidance relative to specifically what is going to be required to be submitted relative to documentation. It may just be that the employer needs to certify that they have the documentation that remains to be seen. I, I had another one come in that says, uh, if someone exhausts their two weeks of paid leave, um, ES, EPSLA for self isolation via the recommendation of their healthcare provider. Can they file for FMLA to keep their job if they do not wish to return to work yet after the two weeks? So, um, great question. <laughs> Depends. Um, so if I go out on paid sick leave and I go out on paid sick leave because of, uh, what was the reason you gave, Joanna? Uh, it says that uh, they, they exhausted their two weeks of paid sick leave for self-isolation self via the recommendation of their healthcare provider. Okay, so let's assume that that individual, as the question presents, um, has used the, the 80 hours, the two weeks of the paid sick leave. They're not going to qualify um, on that basis for the extended FMLA under um, the FFCRA. However, whether that individual qualifies um, by virtue of having a serious health condition for regular FMLA is a different issue. And so it's important to keep in mind that as, as, as you're navigating, um, that you don't forget that individuals, uh, the employees still may have regular FMLA rights. The interrelationship between this extended FMLA and the regular FMLA, um, the extended does not create an additional 12 weeks. Employees just have the 12 week allotment. And so if an employee has already used up a portion or all of the 12 week allotment before the COVID circumstance presents on the school closure for the extended FMLA, um, they're out of luck. Uh, they don't, you know, they're not going to have um, an opportunity to go and extend from 12 now beyond on the school closing or childcare basis. So um, how these laws interact, you, you need to be careful and um, make sure that you're watching for that interrelationship between um, the different types of leaves. Thank you. Um, did we answer the question? Somebody, Steve Baden had asked, uh, what has Jasmine heard regarding enforce, enforcement actions for businesses and individuals violating the stay-at-home order? I don't know if we an answered that one. Jasmine? Uh, uh, you're on mute, Jasmine. Oh. Uh, 
clearly I'm having some computer issues today. Um, but yes, we did we did answer that question. The enforcement penalties of seven hundred fifty dollars or up, up to or including ninety days in jail, as well as the recent nu nuisance action we filed that saw filed at least in Cuyahoga County. Um, but it's going to vary county by county in, in terms of what the county uh, health department is doing, working with employers uh, versus filing legal action. Okay, great. Thank you. My apologies. Does um so it, you know we we got a great number of questions today. Um, has anyone asked a question that hasn't been answered, or have a, a question that builds upon one of the answers that's already been given? Uh, you are welcome to raise your hand in the system if you want us to um, to answer a, an additional question. I'm looking to see anyone. Anyone has any additional questions? I'm looking through the names of the attendees to see if we have anyone raising their hands. So I'm not seeing anyone. Uh, Joanna, are there any other questions that you know of that we haven't answered yet in the in the queue? Um I thought that we had uh, answered everything. Uh, let's see, there's one that just came in um, where employee is laid off, uh, not terminated before April 1st from business with less than 25 employees. Is the employee eligible for sick leave and is now receiving unemployment? So quick answer is no. Um, and and you can take this beyond beyond the question. So, um, if an employee is laid off or if the um, company is closed, um, either before April 1st or after April 1st, uh, that individual will not be entitled to any of the leave provisions under the FFCRA. That individual is will likely qualify provided they meet the um, minimum weeks and the minimum wage requirements under unemployment law, they'll likely qualify for um, state unemployment and or federal unemployment benefits. And it looks like we have uh, one last question because we're at the top of the hour. Um, if we have an employee who made people think he was exposed and everyone else says they won't come in if he stays, can we make him go home for 14 days and tell him to apply for unemployment so others will come in? Um, and then there's a clarifying, this employee, to clarify, this employee knew someone who died but was never exposed. Wow. <laughs> um, Jasmine, you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> <laughs> if I can get off mute. Yeah. So while you're while you're doing that, um okay. so oh go ahead. Go ahead. Well, yeah, so I guess the question that, that I would ask is what whether or not the employee qualifies under the paid sick leave. Have they confirmed that they had any exposure? And I think that you're gonna need to get something from him in writing, um, stating if he's now, if he's already stated to other employees that he's, he believes he's been exposed, uh, you need to confirm, get confirmation from him in writing the truth or the falsehood <laughs> of the statement that he he previously made. Um, and if he has not been exposed um, and is not seeking um, guidance from a healthcare provider, then he won't qualify for the paid sick leave. Um, and at that point in time, I think you are likely disciplining him for causing, you know, panic or something within the workplace, under one of your under one of your policies, um, Sarah, what do you, what do you think? It's a tough one. Um, yeah. So you know, if, I like what you said. Um, you know, I think that um, it's it's a tough one because you really need to make sure you nail the documentation on it. You know, relative to how you work through that process. Um, from a defensibility vantage point. Um, so it'll be important to your point to um, make sure that 
we are getting from this in, individual exactly what their story is. <laughs> so, you know, did, what are you actually saying? You were exposed. Um, you know, who, who is it that you were exposed to? Um, what was the circumstance? I think it's, to your point, important to nail down what is this, what is this person's story? And then react to the situation based on what's provided in writing. I, I think there is a lot of um, leeway for employers right now to be able to make decisions that protect uh, the rest of the workforce. But that said, we all need to remember that this will be armchair quarterbacked at some point with some, you know, creative plaintiff's attorney. And Correct. so that's why the documentation becomes so, so critical, um, uh, you know, right down to the days that decisions are made because things are moving so quickly with the guidances from the CDC and the health departments that what looks reasonable today could look completely unreasonable in two days. Um, so it's important to capture, I think, all of the information and circumstances as you move through it. Ultimately, if this is just a, a bad apple who is, um, to your point, inducing panic, I, I agree there's a potential for discipline. Um, we could just we could just be dealing with someone who's who's afraid. You know, it's a fear-driven response. And um, you know, how do we deal with? an individual who has simply a fear-driven response who doesn't uh, necessarily know any better. <laughs> um, there are those out there and given the circumstances, you know, how much grace and mercy are we gonna show people uh, as we move through things? But at the end of the day, we have businesses to run and operate and we need to make the right decisions for um, the entirety of our workforce, not just for one person. So I get it, yeah. So there is one last, why don't we do one last question, if that's all right? Last one, I am still unclear if the paid days off under FFCRA must be consecutive. For example, can an employee stay home due to fever for three days this week, then come back for work two days, then claim to have symptoms the next week and be able to use more days under the FFCRA? I understand they may not take partial days. My question is specifically pertains to if they must be consecutive. So it's going to depend on whether they're teleworking or whether they're at a physical job site. If they're at a physical job site and they take uh, the paid sick leave on the basis of symptoms, then they are going to have to use full days. They cannot use intermittent. And those full days need to be used consecutively until such time as the person is released from um, the healthcare provider as being able to return to work or the uh, entirety of the 80 hours is used up. Um, if, if the person's in a telework environment, uh, then they're going to be able to use uh, it on in the, the paid sick leave component on an intermittent basis. And you could see the taking two days and taking two days off, taking three days sort of thing, provided that the employer agreed to um, have the intermittent leave. So the employer could take the stance that we're not gonna provide intermittent in that basis. You take care of yourself, you recover, you take the entirety of the 80 hours consecutively. Hopefully that answers it. Okay, great, thank you so much. So if you notice everyone um, on the, this slide with the Q&A, we do have um, information you can visit fisherphillips.com. They have um, a complete resource page with uh, COVID-19 uh, updates and guidance and, and probably some of the forms that um, were referenced in our, our, our webinar today. Um, and then of course, if you wish to follow up, um, we will be sending this deck along with, um, you will be able to access this recording for, for reference, but also um, for the contact information of everyone who presented. Um, but you can reach out to um, Fisher Phillips directly to contact them for follow-up questions and, and whatnot. But um, I want to, you know, thank everyone for joining us today. Um, sorry we went over a little bit um, over time, but I think it was there were a lot of great questions um, stemming from the the, the great uh, presentation. Uh, and thank you to Fisher Phillips, uh, Jasmine, Sarah. Uh, and Jeff for sharing your prof professional insight. We really appreciate that. And of course, lastly, thank you to the Greater Cleveland Partnership for allowing us this opportunity. And, and if I may, Betsy, thank you for all your work on our behalf. Uh, we appreciate um, 
everything that you do. Um, and uh, thank you, Joanna, and Greater Cleveland Partnership for the opportunity to be with you today. Yes, you're welcome. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, special thanks to the team from Fisher Phillips for sharing such great information and insight with us today. And thanks to all of you all for joining us. We appreciate you hanging out with us uh, after the 1 p.m. hour for just a few more minutes. We at Greater Cleveland hope you found today's presentation engaging and informative. If you have thoughts to share, please let us know. This concludes today's session. Thanks again. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.